of all, I have to retrain myself to Windows after having been exiled to Macland for a while. Technology making our lives easier again. First of all, thanks very much indeed. Um, um, I have looked at the program and looked at a bit of the past of the, the conference series, uh, and I think it's just uh, impressive, simply impressive, what has been brought together here. And to be asked by David and his colleagues on the organizing committee uh, to somehow uh, come in and, and say something uh, is tremendously humbling, if not simply frightening. Um, so I'll see, see if I can offer you something here. Uh, this is sort of the, the structure of things. Um, I want to get some of my philosophical cards on the table because I see some well-known friends and colleagues who uh, have their traditions there. But then I want to bring us forward to some religious and philosophical frameworks uh, regarding the norms of modern technology, robots, and sex bots. I'll then curve into how that has us think about sex and love in the modern era, uh, but then bring that closer to the contemporary poles of the debate, both in the popular literature and in uh, the literature that is emerging on this, uh, using David Levy and Kathleen Richardson as um, the poles of that debate. I will try to strike middle grounds uh, following the work of John Sullins, but also adding the work of uh, the care ethicist Sarah Ruddick, uh, and then have some concluding comments. I want to stress here uh, that all I'm trying to do is to sketch out some very large frameworks, uh, to some degree kind of uncovering the water in which we swim, at least within the Western traditions. Uh, it would have been a lot of fun to try to bring on board more of uh, other traditions that I'm familiar with, but um, we want to keep this on time. So I apologize for the focus, but um, we'll move out of that focus towards the end. This is, in a way, intending to give uh, a kind of map of the terrain, as far as I can tell, in terms of sexual ethics and sex bots in particular. And if it does anything useful, I hope it simply provides some initial terms, uh, a kind of universe of discourse uh, that will be useful uh, as at least a starting point for what I'm confident is going to be a very wide range of insights and arguments, uh, discussions as we go along. So that's what I hope to have happen. Uh, I'm a 60s kid, and the longer I'm around, the more I think it's important that people know that, uh, because uh, I grew up in that very turbulent era of the sexual revolution. So yes, the word sex does not scare me. Uh, but that was only part of a larger set of emancipatory movements, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the anti-Vietnam, the environmental movement, and so forth. I cut my teeth on Nietzsche. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss different readings of Nietzsche uh, with anyone who would like. Uh, gradually came to Kant, uh, but my emphasis is on philosophy as liberation. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, it has an ancient tradition. Uh, you may know the allegory of the cave, um, but that's the ground in which uh, I try to work. I'm a fan of Kant's motto for the Enlightenment, think for yourself, partly because it was that Enlightenment that Norbert Wiener picked up uh, as he brought virtue ethics to bear on what has become the contemporary traditions of information and computing ethics. I have some Nietzschean commitments, uh, anti-dualism. Christianity is the metaphysics of the hangman, uh, to be blunt. Uh, but moving into a kind of affirmation of this life then, and an artist metaphysics, is a way of trying to deal with meaning making following the death of God, and so on. So that's, as they say, where I'm coming from. Also a trekker or Trekkie, uh, long time coming. That was a great way to be exposed to the questions of computing and philosophy that came up in the 1980s with the computing and philosophy conferences that have now morphed into other things. Uh, and what I have in mind here then is a long sort of exploration of using uh, machines and the relationships between machines 
to help us think carefully about what we can replicate about ourselves in these devices and what we may not be able to replicate. Uh, for those of you who know the first season of Star Trek, the original series, the fellow on the left, the left is a human being who has been turned into an android uh, and has now been damaged, and you're seeing his damaged hand. And this is 20 years before Luke Skywalker pulled the same stunt. Uh, and it's actually a very thoughtful reflection about how do we sustain our humanity uh, as we become more and more machine-like. You may not be surprised that the young woman on the right is an android as well, and she will be a type that we will see uh, frequently. Finally, I have a lot of experience uh, <laughs> I put a lot of time in in teaching applied ethics, including the ethics of sexuality, uh, but also uh, the backgrounds and causes of domestic violence. Uh, it's disturbing to discover that women you know, including your relatives or friends, uh, are the victims of this. Uh, Thirty years have gone by. Uh, things are better, but uh, that shapes some of my concerns. So here's my bibliography, and be happy to share versions of that as we go along, but let's try to proceed. I want to start by picking up with uh, Augustine and Descartes, because Descartes draws from Augustine. So this is where we're going to go way back. Um, and again, the, the, this may seem strange at a computer conference, but uh, the longer I explore these things, the more I think uh, these things may still form the waters in which we swim, and it would be helpful to be aware of them. So Augustine reinterpreted the second Genesis creation story as a fall story. Uh, this was a new interpretation at the time, a fall from a kind of pre-sexual childhood innocence by way of the original sin of human disobedience. This was influenced by Greek and specifically Gnostic beliefs in the soul as a kind of pure spark that fell from a disembodied heaven. Augustine further argued that this fall manifests itself, first of all, in an especially male inability to exercise rational control over sexuality and thereby the body. For those of you who've read William Gibson's Neuromancer, you will find the fall language in there. It shapes that, and it shapes our conceptions of cyberspace, uh, but I don't have time to, to suggest that here. But this dualism is very, very hard to get rid of. What this led to for Augustine and the followers in uh, orthodoxy was a simple demonization of women, body, and sexuality. Uh, so if you explore medieval art, for example, you will discover that the snake Satan is female, um, and this very directly leads to such things as the demonization of women as witches. Uh, this is uh, a lithograph or a wood carving, wood carving from um, woodcut from uh, a, a witch burning in Trondheim, Norway, uh, in the early 1500s. So this this is this is one of the things that I find concerning. Uh, these are issues that I think need to be paid attention to especially because they creep into modernity in ways that we may or may not be aware of. So if we look quickly at Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, Bacon is credited with the great instauration at the surface. It's a kind of rejection of earlier medieval, especially Christian, and then before them Greek understandings of the role of mathematics and natural science on the surface. But it brings forward to what we now think science and technology should be about, power, power and control power and control over nature, but something interesting happens. Bacon is explicit. He invokes the fall story. For man by the fall fell at the same time from his state of innocency and from his dominion over creation. Both of these losses, however, can even in this life be in some part repaired, the former by religion and faith, the latter by arts and sciences. Arts and sciences, new technologies have the brief, they have the goal of restoring human domination or dominion over nature out of that old Christian trope. Descartes follows this. Those of you who've read your Descartes know that he has given us a dualism uh, drawn in part from Augustine. We talk about it in terms of the dualism between mind and body. Um, what becomes thematic then is by making this distinction between the human as a self, as a rational self up here, somehow radically divorced from a body and thereby the natural order down here, we can now become, as he puts it in the Discourse on Method, the masters and possessors of nature. You don't have to be religious, and you don't have to know much about religious history, but when you say the master and possessor of nature, you should think, first of all, uh, we used to call God that. 
But we've lost touch with that, for better and for worse. We will become God in the modern era. We will become the masters and possessors of nature. And Descartes thereby echoes Bacon. In detail, what Descartes gives us are the thematic goals or ends of modern technology, both of which I really like. The first one is that we will be able to enjoy without any trouble the fruits of the earth and all the good things which are to be found there without labor, without trouble. The second thing is the preservation of health through medicine with the hope that we could be free of an infinitude of maladies, both of body and mind, and even also possibly of the infirmities of age. The Catholic readers of this Catholic text instantly recognized what he was talking about because labor and death in the Augustinian reading are the punishments that follow. They are the human condition that we deserve because of disobedience. And so they read Descartes' discourse and they accused him of heresy. He was in very serious trouble. They, they read his discourse as saying, you want to reverse the condition of the fall. You want life without labor and life without illness, possibly life without end, inf internal life. You don't have to look very far in modern, in modern technology to see this. The strongest example is, of course, transhumanist efforts that promise some kind of digital immortality in a disembodied body, excuse me, disembodied mind that is somehow downloaded into a computer technology. I don't think the transhumanists know that they owe this to Augustine or Descartes, uh, but as far as I can tell, they're still operating in that same framework. On the one hand, this divide between the self and the person on the one hand and then body and nature on the other helps justify the idea that we can master this natural order. This leads to a problem though, several problems, regarding how do we then understand the relationship between the human subject, the self, the I, the person versus the body. It's the self or the person that's distinctive. It's the self or the person that makes moral commitments. Bodies are just matter. Bodies are just matter. But that's where sex happens, apparently. So what do we conceptualize? How do we conceptualize sex and make sense of it? This is a fairly standard position in the philosophy of sex. Um, Alan Goldman is one of the more prominent uh, philosophers in these domains, and he has defined something he calls plain sex, which is very useful, and I want to emphasize this is morally neutral, at least to start with. He, defi he defines plain sex precisely in these terms, the desire for physical contact with another person as a minimal criterion. Of course, we may want to express other feelings through sexual acts in various contexts, but the desire for physical contact in itself without the wish to express affection or other feelings through it is sufficient to render sexual the activity, the agent which fulfills it. So sex can simply be somehow bodies generically exchanged that may be connected somehow with feelings or moral commitments, but it's not clear that there's any kind of necessary connection. Uh, in fact, it's hard to conceptualize how this works out. This becomes especially problematic, I think, because we already see that in Descartes and his followers, uh, this is, of course, radically gendered. Uh, for Descartes, reason is masculine. For Descartes and his followers, body and nature, matter is female. Matter comes from the word mater in Latin, mother. And so the whole language about mother earth, the <coughs> earth is female, uh, that's not accidental. And so the mastery and possession uh, of nature has not only led to certain environmental problems that we are now acutely aware of, uh, but it also leads to two issues regarding women, men, and sexuality. One of these is that uh, if all you have is this master-slave duality, if all you have is this kind of mind versus body as it's gendered, it looks like this is the way that normal sex between males and females should happen. So this is a shot from the virtual world, uh, uh, excuse me, Second Life, the world of gore, uh, which plays this out, uh, sometimes with interesting consequences in the real world. But that would seem to be a problem. The second problem, or the larger problem, is how do we connect sex to individual persons and hence moral commitments? Uh, if we have only Cartesian dualism, this seems very tricky. Uh, sex should be just plain sex. It should be like shaking hands, or it could be group sex. 
uh, I subscribe to a, a very nice left-wing journal uh, in Norway that discusses these matters uh, with the kind of frank Scandinavian openness to the goodness of body. So in case you're wondering what you're looking at, this is a group sex uh, stylized. Um, I hope nobody's sensibilities are offended. Um, but I thought it, you know, it illustrates. Why not? If it's just like shaking hands, why not? That's not an invitation, by the way. <laughs> so what does all this have to do? And what it all has to do is this has not gone away. On the contrary, it seems to be shaping the way we continue to think about these things. And so you may know that robot comes from a Czech word, which eventually traces down to slave. Um, and you see this in the sort of filmic uh, approach we have to uh, robots, starting with Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Uh, the robot is the machine and mensch. I'll be damned. She's female. Um, the creation of a male. Uh, the counterpart in the story, if you haven't seen the film, I strongly recommend you see it, is the clearly virginal uh, Maria. Uh, the film is deeply placed within uh, standard religious frameworks, and she is the sort of savior of the working class against the oppressive masters. But as the story unfolds, her soul is uh, transplanted into the robot, and so she becomes the ultimate seductress. And so she goes up, and uh, here she is figured as the whore of Babylon. Again, it's, it's, quietly, it's quite biblical uh, in that way. And she proves to be so powerfully seductive that uh, the men in the upper city go mad with desire and kill one another. Uh, in religious studies terms, she's a chaos agent. Uh, I guess other kinds of terms as well. In the modern era, this, this kind of Augustinian view gets uh, ramified and added to in the romantic critique of modern technology as hubris, uh, starting with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Again, this is language from the biblical tradition. Uh, Frankenstein, the monster, is unhappy because he has been rejected. He has been created, and then he's been rejected. And he uses this clear biblical language. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am the, rather the fallen angel, whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. And this is not just romantic literature from the 1800s. This drives the thread in philosophy of technology, most prominently affiliated with Langdon Winner. But it also leads to something called the techno femme fatale from our colleague in media studies, Mia Consalvo. Uh, so here's the first instance, the techno femme fatale. Uh, it is trivially easy to pile up pictures of female robots that are dangerous. Um, I've got about 100 now, and I haven't even really tried. But this is a Cylon from uh, Galactic, uh, Battlestar Galactica, the miniseries, uh, that you may remember. Uh, and my absolute favorite recently, because I think the film is so terrific, is uh, Alicia Vikander as Eva. Can you say Bible boys and girls? Eva? Uh, yes. So there we are. Naturally, then, it seems, can we ask the question, do sex bots escape these frameworks? Do they escape the frameworks? Um, this is my absolute favorite picture. Uh, this is Roxy uh, of True Companion. When I showed this picture the first time, one of my colleagues in the audience said, which one is the robot? And at the time, I thought, OK, this is funny. You know, yeah. Before I'm done, I hope you will, you will see, I hope to make clear to you, that actually is, in fact, a very perceptive and central question. Which one is the robot? So uh, again, it's trivially easy to pile up examples. Uh, these are from um, various places. You type in sex doll or sex robot, and you'll get these kinds of pictures. You get them both within the Western world. You get them in Japan, uh, and we're off and running. So what I'm after is it seems like these underlying ontological assumptions and dualisms, including a masculine mastery and possession of female nature, drives modern technology broadly and may be driving the development of sex bots in particular. From my perspective, these Augustinian dualisms are profoundly damaging to women, to sexuality, to men's conception of women and sexuality, and so prima facie, their Cartesian version as driving sex bot design would likewise seem ethically and sexually questionable. At least I think the burden of proof is on the folk who are proponents of this, including David Levy, 
and analogous technologies. Show me that these technologies will not lead us down these, these same paths. And I will try to show that with um, especially the work of Sarah Ruddick. But uh, some of you know this book. It's, it's kind of been a, a watershed publication, David Levy's Love and Sex with Robots. Uh, and then I'll also look at Kathleen Richardson's uh, campaign against sex bots. Um, I will use a little bit of utilitarianism, a little bit of uh, deontology and feminist ethics and so forth, but I'll try to explain those as we go along. So if you interrogate David Levy's uh, Love and Sex with Robots, he assumes that by 20 or 2050 or so, we will have robots that have complete natural language capacities, allowing them to converse with humans uh, on any topic in any desired voice, male, female, young, old, dull, sexy. Uh, more critically, he believes that the robots of the mid 21st century will also possess human-like or superhuman-like consciousness and emotions. Two key words, consciousness and emotions. This is deeply questionable. First of all, let's start with first person phenomenal consciousness. And there's different definitions of this, but very broadly one can think of this as our capacity for self-consciousness, a self-reflective I that among other things is the arena within which we are aware of and experience and respond to our emotions. As far as I can tell, the current view seems to be, and I'm using Summer Brings for it as one example, but there are others, that no matter how good we are getting at getting at engineering AIs to pass the Turing test or its equivalents, no one is claiming that we are creating self-consciousness. They can pass the tests, but no one is claiming that there is an I in there. So many of you know about Watson, who uh, defeated the world's best Go player recently. Even IBM is, is being honest about this, and they're saying there's no I in Watson that is reflecting on the game. This is processing. Uh, Watson is being brought into Norway to help with cancer and is doing phenomenal kinds of analyses and so forth. IBM is being modest and saying this is a great tool. It will do things that a human doctor cannot do but there are things that the human doctor will still do that the machine cannot. Being reflective, sensitive, empathic, understanding. It's out of reach. So Selmer, Selmer uses the analog uh, of the zombie, that we can get them to pass the tests, but computing machines, AIs, robots, and so on are all zombies, uh, which is perhaps less exciting. Levy is a software engineer, as most of you probably know, and he was already aware that this might be a problem. Uh, and those of you who don't know how robotics have evolved, especially over the last 10 years, know that, uh, yeah, we focus on artificial emotions these days. Uh, for Levy, this is good. The capacity to mimic human emotion, gesture, body language, all of that stuff, is good enough because it triggers in us an anthropomorphizing belief that the machine actually does care for us. And so he says, those, there are those who doubt that we can reasonably ascribe feelings to robots, but if a robot behaves as, if though, as though it has feelings, can we reasonably argue that it does not? If a robot's artificial emotions prompt it to say things like, I love you, surely we would be willing to accept these statements at face value. And this is a key point that uh, will be contested. Um, on the one hand, I want to give Levy some due. And I want to say, uh, contrary to Richardson uh, at points, uh, is it good enough to be tricked by the simulacrum of affection? I think sometimes so, but that depends upon your understanding of sexuality, sex, and the interconnections between these and notions of the human being, and it also depends upon your primary ethical frameworks. So for those of you who are not philosophers, I thought those of you who might know something about uh, at least American pop culture, we could put this in different terms. So I want to supplant the Turing test with the Joni Mitchell test. Uh, so there's a lovely song that Joni Mitchell wrote in 1972, Woman of Heart and Mind. Uh, these are some of the lines. I am a woman of heart and mind. I'm looking for affection and respect, a little passion. You want stimulation, nothing else. That's what I think. But still she stays in this relationship. Uh, a still higher bar has been put by my hero, Leonard Cohen. Uh, some of you know the song Hallelujah. It became wildly popular following the movie Shrek. Uh, 
and it has this wonderful line in there, remember when I moved in you, the holy dove was moving too, and every breath we drew was hallelujah. So the complete collapse of the sort of usual notion of the sacred and the profane into one event. Uh, this is uh, Bernini's sculpture of the ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila, and nobody I know can look at that without understanding that this is sexual, while it is at the same time profoundly spiritual. So what I'm interested in are these more monistic or non-dualistic non conceptions, uh, including of the relationship between a mind, a self, a subject, and a body, in contrast with these more dualistic conceptions. So uh, we can think of them in those terms. I, I won't come back to them explicitly, but you want to keep them in mind. Levy thinks that the, the faking of emotion will be good enough because uh, he thinks that the emotional attachments we have by analogy uh, with our pets is very profoundly satisfying. By and large, however, he tends to uh, not focus so much on the connection, say, between emotion and stimulation. Uh, it sometimes seems rather thin. He focuses more on a kind of psychological account as to why people would have sex. Uh, and I, I keep thinking this is probably plain sex, to use Goldman's phrase. Uh, it's pleasure, it's release of tension and stress, it's pursuit of novelty and escape from boredom. Who can quarrel with that? But again, the, the connection between love and sex seems relatively arbitrary. Uh, he acknowledges that uh, love, and love is more important for women uh, than for men, but uh, leaves it as a kind of matter of choice. Uh, this turns him into more strongly consequentialist kinds of ethics, and those of you who know these traditions will recognize the philosophers in play. Uh, we can dwell with that if we need to. But what Levy really emphasizes then is maximizing pleasure, primarily physical pleasure, either for the egoist and or the utilitarian. So again, there are psychological benefits, economic benefits, social benefits, the reduction of teenage pregnancy, et cetera, and clear personal benefits. When sexual boundaries widen, ushering in new sexual opportunities, some bizarre, other exciting. Still, still, my beating heart. He's interested in helping people, and I agree with him here. Uh, there are folk, for all kinds of reasons, not just nerds, who have a difficult time on the dating scene, and sex bots might be really good, might be really useful therapy. Uh, I'm less convinced that if my wife were to die, that purchasing a duplicate of her in machine form would somehow help me emotionally recover, but uh, Levy's also good for paying attention to notions of rights for robots. Uh, his book concludes with a literally climactic ending. If you haven't read it, and this, this may be a little R-rated, I'm sorry. People will want better robot sex, and even better robot sex, and better still robot sex. Their sexual appetites becoming voracious as the technologies improve, bringing ever higher levels of joy with each experience. And it is quite possible that the terms sex maniac and nymphomaniac will take on new meanings or at least new dimensions as to what are perceived to be natural levels of human sexual desire change to conform to what is newly available. Great sex on tap for everyone 24-7. Is anyone tired yet? Okay. This is not obviously everyone's understanding of sexuality. Uh, Kathleen Richardson is most well known, and partly because of her own work in using social robots to help children with autism. She has a number of critiques, but I'm going to um, uh, highlight only some pieces of them. Uh, part of the problem for her is the way in which Levy does make an analogy between sex bots and prostitution. And she counters by saying, look, the problem in both of those is that we treat people, or we treat the object, as not having a subject. Going back to Descartes, we would have to. We lose track of subjectivity uh, and persons who have certain kinds of rights. This is a deontological objection, the objection to denying human autonomy, dignity, and so on by treating others as a thing or an object. Um, Levy argues that if we have sex bots, that the prostitution rates will go down and Richardson counters that, in, in the contrary, the more sex toys we have, the more people go to prostitutes. I don't know. That'd be interesting data to look into. What I think is also critical in her account is the role of empathy in human interactions, the ability to recognize, take into account, and respond to one another, person's genuine thoughts and feelings. And so this is where virtue ethics comes in. 
The simplest one sentence definition of virtue ethics I can give you is we are what we practice. We become what we practice. And empathy is a particular kind of skill or capacity that must be practiced. It has to be learned. It doesn't come naturally. Empathy, along with other virtues such as patience, perseverance, trust, and respect, and we will see loving itself, is clearly essential to the basic human goods of communication, friendship, intimate relationships, and flourishing more broadly. So if you know the work of Shannon Valor, a virtue ethicist, uh, she's been especially good about bringing forward the importance of these virtues in the human condition. Precisely because Kathleen has recognized that empathy is the problem in, spect in autism spectrum disorders, and she argues men who buy sex, buy sex from prostitutes, uh, the lack of empathy, empathy thereby reinforces the deontological objection. The buyer of sex is at liberty to ignore the state of the other person as a human being or a human subject who is turned into a thing. There's a final critique. Uh, the robotics industry, by developing sex bots that are predominantly female, young, attractive, and designed for service roles, thereby mirror and thus reinforce prevailing cultural models of race, class, and gender. And so, uh, yes, that's not hard to document. Although, here's where you get a choice. This is from The Real Doll Company, and it's to try to illustrate very quickly that objectification slides immediately into commodification. So if you order your real doll, you get to choose the nipples. Um, somehow I'm not excited, but maybe I'm just getting old, as is possible. So one can understand some of her, her objections. John Sullins has been the first to respond uh, critically to um, Levy from a couple of standpoints as a philosopher. Come back to the question, is simulacrum sufficient? And most of us know, I think, Sherry Turkle's work uh, in which she argues that, uh, yes, we understand we can build devices that trigger a kind of response that make us think that somehow these devices care for us. Sometimes that's extremely helpful. So this is Paro, uh, baby harp seal. Uh, developed by a Japanese roboticist that is extremely useful in care settings. So by no means do I want to argue this is always bad. Uh, sometimes this can be quite helpful. But to go back to Levy's question, if the robot behaves as though it has feelings, can we reasonably argue that it does not? Yes, absolutely we can. Uh, the current state of the art again suggests that this simply will not happen, but there's also the deontological objection to know, knowingly trick another human being to deceive that other human being is disrespectful of human agency. Solons brings in Plato's conception of eros. Um, if there's any philosopher more contested than Nietzsche, it's probably Plato. So I'll be happy to have conversations with you, preferably at a symposium style setting over wine and beer, uh, about my understanding of, of eros in Plato. Uh, what I'm going to do here for the sake of time is, is emphasize uh, how Sullins does it, what Sullins says about it. In an erotic relationship, we come into a relationship impoverished, only half knowing what we need. We can only find the philosophically erotic through the encounter with the complexity of the beloved, complexity that not only includes passion, but may include a little pain, rejection, from which we learn and grow. I've tried to elaborate that a bit, so this may be an overreading. I would be happy to have it clarified and improved upon. I think in my mind, Eros uh, thereby highlights the autonomy of the beloved as a complete human being, one who brings into such a relationship the full range of distinctive interests, desires, experiences, fallibilities, strengths, demands, emotive responses, and so on that are specific to just that person. Can you tell I've been married for 38 years? Yes. Erotic love thereby entails a kind of ignorance and correlative surprise. We do not fully or completely know what we seek in an, er in an erotic relationship. Plain sex? Yes. Erotic relationship? Not so much. This is because of the unexpected discovery of the other who surprises us with the gifts and abilities that she or he brings. Gifts and abilities that fulfill us in ways we could not anticipate because it's only in the meeting with the other that we first come to recognize the deficits in ourselves and our lives that the other begins to fill and complement. 
I can quote you chapter and verse in the symposium if we want to, but that's my understanding of it. And again, this ties directly into the virtues, learning the virtues of empathy, but also compassion, forgiveness, perseverance, and patience, and respect for the beloved as an autonomy. What this means is I cannot order my erotic other, even if I get a choice of nipple sizes. Not the same thing. The last, uh, last philosopher I want to bring to play in, uh, is Sarah Ruddick. Uh, she wrote a paper in 1975 before she became so well known as the founder of Care Ethics. It's called Better Sex. Uh, she starts out by emphasizing that any sexual act that is pleasurable is prima facie good. Uh, so this sounds like plain sex or stimulation. This is not morally neutral, it's prima facie good. But distinctions can be made. And so she starts from a phenomenological uh, account of complete experiences. And what's striking about complete experiences is that they are absolutely non-dualistic. So we know from experiences, say, in sport, uh, any sense of separation between mind and body disappears. We are no longer aware of ourselves as minds somehow driving our bodies. Rather, we enjoy the experience of complete embodiment. The self or subject is fully intermeshed with all the body is engaged in. This is absolutely contrary to Descartes. Uh, the self is infused, or our bodies are infused with our subjectivity and choice. Ruddick talks about this in part in terms of desire, and the language gets almost Heideggerian or Hegelian, but she starts by emphasizing the importance of actively desiring not simply the other, but we actively desire that the other actively desire us, not simply lie there. 1975 second wave feminism, this was rather radical stuff. It commits the activity, the actively desiring person to her desire and requires her to identify with it. That is to recognize herself as a sexual agent, not simply as it was in the day, a woman who is being pursued and has to play coy. What this embodied sexual agency coupled with reciprocal desire leads to is respect for persons as equals. And so she says, in complete sex, two persons embodied by sexual desire actively desire and respond to each other's active desire. Desire, desiring, desire, if you want to be tricky about it. Complete sex is reciprocal sex. The partners, whatever the circumstances of their coming together, are equal in activity and responsiveness of desire and agency. And so for her, complete sex, which she acknowledges is quite rare, I'm always nervous about this part of the lecture because the first time I did it, one of my female colleagues said she just got lost because she was wondering if she'd ever had this experience, which is kind of a, you know, sorry question, a difficult question to have to wrestle. I'm sorry if I've raised that question for you. But this as an account gives us an understanding of sexuality that has certain moral preferences. Uh, what I want to stress is it has the preference of connecting to a primary moral virtue, namely respect for persons, and love itself as a virtue. Those of us who have been in long-term relationships, I think, know, yes, there's this wonderful sort of flurry of erotic energy and fun, uh, and then you have to settle down to the work of sustaining a relationship when it's not always easy. It takes practice. This is especially tricky in the context of sexuality. It, don't have to say much about this, it's easy to know. It's precisely in the context of sexuality that it is so easy to treat the other as the object, as a means to your particular ends. And this is a wonderful text, uh, but I'll save it. I'll be happy to share the, the slides. The, the point is that respect requires encouraging or at least protecting the autonomy of the other in this kind of engagement. So. Could we have complete sex with a 2050 robot, one foreseeably marked by artificial autonomy, artificial agency, and responsibility? I haven't mentioned phronesis. Uh, phronesis is an important word in ethics. It's a kind of reflective judgment that virtue ethics stresses. Uh, many of us are arguing that along with first-person consciousness uh, and emotions, that phronesis is also not computationally tractable. Um, but I'm leaving that for aside for the moment. Could we have complete sex with a robot that does not have first person consciousness, awareness or self consciousness as we construe it? 
and not real emotions and desires. Again, this could be wonderful in many ways, but in the end, these are zombies. So the analysis, I think, is fairly clear. In these terms, you could have good sex with a robot zombie. And I, I, I use the term zombie a little unhappily because I don't want to take away from that. There are ways in which it's quite important and quite useful and quite defensible. But con complete sex would require self-consciousness as the foundation of autonomy, respect for personhood, and mutuality of desire. What I discovered when I put this paper together, what I wasn't expecting, was the surprise that this flips and turns around. These, by the way, are, are, are at least filmic imaginations of who you might have complete sex, or at least good sex with. Uh, if you can find a male robot in the form of Jude Law, you're probably going to have a good time. So again, virtue ethics, you are, you become what you practice becoming. Ruddick's account foregrounds the importance of not simply uh, for sex, but in-depth communication, long-term human relationships and commitments, an extensive spectrum of human engagements that make society possible and thereby a life of flourishing. This requires virtues. This requires skills and abilities that are difficult. They must be practiced and acquired. These include empathy, respect, and loving itself. So what this means is, go back to which one is the robot? And from a virtue ethics perspective, the, the answer would be, it depends on what you practice. In a kind of thought experiment approach, if all you knew how to do was have good sex with a robot, if that's all you practiced, then you would, in virtue ethics terms, you would either not ever learn the skills or you would de-skill yourself from the kinds of virtues that are required for not just complete sex, but for human communication society more broadly. So in my mind, what's kind of interesting about this is if you worry about or you're interested in sustaining some kind of important distinction between human beings and machines, this puts the burden back on us in terms of heightening our obligation, duty, interest, whatever it is, in cultivating or practicing these virtues, including love itself. And I'm sorry to quote Augustine uh, again if that bothers you, but even Augustine said, do whatever you will as long as you love. He wasn't wrong all the time. So the distinctions between good sex and complete sex make room for middle ground approaches is part of the point. So contra Richardson, I think good sex with AIs and robots is possible and morally legitimate on several, several grounds, uh, not just for misfits, but for all kinds of folk. Contrary to Levy, however, I think complete sex remains distinctively human, ethically preferable on especially deontological and virtue ethics grounds. Again, complete sex sets a very high bar, uh, but I think that high bar has to be established. Uh, go back to the 1960s. I struggled to be a conscientious objector to a war that I thought was immoral, and I had to learn how to deal with these matters of do you obey superior but illegal orders? The superior order telling the soldiers to go into the village of Milai and slaughter the inhabitants. Superior order, but illegal order, because in just war, we are supposed to protect the civilians. They're the ones we're there to save for. Not everyone is capable of that kind of civil disobedience. Not everyone was capable of participating in uh, Martin Luther King's nonviolent civil disobedience that helped brought about, bring about enormous change in the United States. So yes, it's a very high bar. Not everybody can be obliged or should be obliged to get there, but neither do I want it forgotten or neglected. What I want to uh, close with then is this emphasis that by keeping in mind a non-dual understanding of the subject body, uh, Barbara Becker is a phenomenological philosopher who's now unfortunately, very unfortunately, passed away to cancer. She used this. Uh, Neologism in German, Leib subject, we are a body subject all the time. Uh, never think of it as just a body, never think of us as just a subject. We are embodied in these ways. This should help counter the objectification and commodification of women and children. It should help counter a modernist trope of male mastery and possession of female nature via technology. And thereby, I hope it will help counter Cartesian reinscriptions of these Augustinian dualisms that demonize women, body, and sexuality in favor of more erotic and loving relationships that turn on equality and respect for persons. 
This is not just theory. Um, with Nietzsche and Aristotle, I would say that's nice. I'm glad you've developed a theory. Can you do it? Can you prove it? And so uh, it's now been recently announced that there will be a new research project on integrative social robotics. Uh, this will be at the University of Aarhus, led by uh, Johannes Seibt. Uh, and we are very fortunate to, to have the help and participation of Hiroshi Ishiguro, who is probably the most well-known roboticist uh, on the planet. Uh, uh, these are for his geminid robots. So I hope in another two or three or four years, the project has a five-year life, to be able to come back to you and say, yeah, I got this part right. No, we were wrong on that one. And I still don't know. So on that confident conclusion, thank you very much for your practicing the virtue of patience and perseverance. And I look forward to your conversations. Thank you. Charles, for that extremely stimulating talk. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, have you got the microphones with you? You have. Splendid. Um, so we have volunteers with microphones. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. And now that I've given you a moment to think, who wants to put their hand up first? <laughs> Don. I was waiting for the microphone. I was waiting for the mic. Uh. One of the things that puzzles me is we now talk about machine learning with robots. And that is they encounter situations and they start to uh, learn what emotions are or how they are manifested. Um, is it possible that one of these robots will learn to have respect and also teach you how to be civilly disobedient and maybe learn as, I, I, enjoyed your language because when you spoke about your civil disobedience, you used the word you needed to learn. And you gathered this from other folks. And I'm wondering how the concept of machine learning that is giving the robot the power to make <clears throat> judgments from its social environment affects your thesis. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, first of all, of course, I can only surmise what machine learning will be capable of by listening to the people who are doing the programming and what they say. So my, again, my understanding is that what's going on in machine learning is, in effect, learning how to imitate, particularly when it comes to emotions. So um, I'm not trying to say that that's, in, that that's somehow bad, but I, what is still a question is, uh, would a device come to the place that it has self-consciousness and a sense of autonomy that allows it to make reflective choice? That seems un unlikely based on the current state of things. What's interesting, but the flip side of your question that is, is really, really interesting and is actually, John Sullins suggests this, is from a virtue ethics perspective, Right, we really want to teach that device to behave in certain ways. So in John's scenario, it would be programmed with virtues of security and so forth. And as it could learn from human beings, and it might learn certain virtues or certain practices that would be good. But what John has pointed out is, you know, it also might figure, you know, the notion of the phronemos in, in virtue ethics, the good, the good man or the good person. It's not implausible to think that there might emerge robotic good persons for whom other robots or machine learning programs could learn virtues. And add to that, as our continued engagement plays out, we might have to learn new virtues or we might get to learn new virtues in terms of our relationships because there would be new possibilities that we haven't anticipated or we haven't dealt with in a purely human-human engagement. Does that get to your question? We need to carry this on a little yes. bit further because what you have is questions about you're involving a dichotomy here between robot thing. Can robots respect other robots and that be uh, <clears throat> robot to robot love? Don't answer that one. <laughs> they can certainly fake it. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Andrew Adams, major university. Um, one thing I was struck by, you, you, uh, you dealt with the, the, uh, the dualism issue. Um, I think there's still a strong thread of heteronormativity running through the work you've presented here. Um, and I, I think there is definitely uh, scope here for uh, a need to involve queer theory. Uh, absolutely. And uh, part of my point would be that uh, the heteronormativity is embedded with Augustine. And um, uh, part of what I think can come out of virtue ethics if you go back and you read Sarah Ruddick's account, there's nothing heteronormative about it. It's not required between male and female. It, is in, it, it addresses men and women, and it focuses on giving women agency in relationship. But as I read the article, it's irrespect, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, so from my perspective, it, it, it ties directly into the whole liberatory uh, movement, including rights for gay, lesbians, et cetera. But thank you for pointing that out, because uh, if that came across in the presentation, I intended exactly the contrary. I will polish my slides. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, your terms of, um, I think you said, good and complete sex. I was just wondering a little bit. I might have forgotten a bit where, where they came from, the terms. Uh, the, the way you describe complete sex, it's sort of, as I remember, um, indicated reciprocal mm -hmm. sex. Is that, uh, is that what you meant? And in that case, can there, can there be reciprocal sex with a robot, or is that why you're not using that term? Because there can never be reciprocal relationships between a person and, right. and a machine. Yeah, exactly. So, so good sex, either from uh, Ruddick or from uh, Goldman, uh, we start with a, a kind of affirmation. Sex is good. Pleasure is good by default, if it leads to pain or other kinds of you know, unwanted pain, et cetera. Uh, then, then we may have moral problems. But there's a place for good sex. Um, more complete sex involves reciprocity, uh, an equality of desire, and equality in terms of respect for persons. And while I have every confidence that we will be building machines that give every appearance of these behaviors, I'm moderately confident that it will not be because there is a self or a reflective self inside somewhere that is saying, oh, I could choose at this moment either to respect my partner as an equal and to appreciate the desire, or I could say the hell with it, and I'm just going to get what I came for, to be sort of crude. Uh, so it's, it's the absence of autonomy uh, in, in, in the as based in a, a phenomenal consciousness, and also the absence of real emotions. Um, I think it's fairly okay to say that uh, if there's a real turnoff in sex, it's when you're really interested and the other person isn't. Uh, we want to be desired. We want to be affirmed in that way, not just for being smart, but for being attractive and engaging. Uh, and a device can fake it, just like prostitutes can fake it. Just like we all fake it sometimes. Uh, there's a role for fakery. Um, but as far as I can tell, the devices will be intrinsically incapable of really having that sense of desire and longing, uh, partly if you resting on incompleteness, that is, is at work in, in Sullen's uh, reference to Eros and Ruddick. Does that help clarify it a little bit? OK. First, I want to thank you about the good sex and, and the, the uh, what was the term, um, fulfilled sex, complete sex division. That was a wonderful idea. But I have a different thing. I, this might shock some of you. Hi, my name is Kai and I masturbate. So to me, a robot would be a masturbatory device. Yeah. 
just something you know modified from well something more complex than my hand I guess and uh, and in that sense I don't think it really that I'd really have to care about using it as an object because it would be just that an object is that what kind of a uh, it fits perfectly, thank you. And, and thank you for the courage. I was asked the same question on TV yesterday. And it's a little easier in a closed group. Uh, can I have my slide back? Uh, I guess not. Um, in, the, in the text that I, I, I went over lightly because um, um, I was worried about, I wanted to make sure there was time for questions. Part of her text is, uh, she says, uh, in, in sexuality, the reason it's difficult to always exercise respect and so forth is that the other is always on the verge of becoming merely a means. Quotes, intercourse counterfeits masturbation. So in a certain way, if you start from the Cartesian standpoint and we only have bodies, it seems like sex could only be some form of masturbation to start with. How could it connect with feelings, moral commitments, individuality, subjectivity, and so forth? Uh, and so she recognizes that. Uh, but again, for her, the default is good sex is good, and so masturbation is fine, uh, prima facie. If it leads to other kinds of problems, then it's an issue. But you're absolutely spot on. Uh, John Sullins says that all we have right now uh, really are just sex dolls, and these are simply elaborate masturbation tools. Uh, whether they're better than our hands or whatever other tools we might be using, matter of choice and preference as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but that's not, a, that's not an objection uh, in any way. It's, a, it's a, a piece of the puzzle, I think, that fits in quite well. Hello? Oh, sorry, uh, Wessel from Dublin. Yes, hi, Wessel. Um, I was wondering, um, because a lot of these discussions are focused on, on, on kind of future possibilities of, of, of what these robots might look like and what they would be capable of doing. Um, I was wondering, is there also already like uh, quite some, because there's a lot of out there that is already happening that could be looked at. Um, for example, when you were talking about the Turing test, there, there are um, artificial dating profiles, for example, that actually mimic already a human behavior to such an extent that people are actually falling in love with them and um, are being deceived. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, to what extent can we already looking at look at the current practices and, for example, also the, the damage that uh, deception does? Because you know, those people um, they judge their experience not on the pleasure they had while dating a fake profile, but they judge it especially on the deception they had, knowing that that it was false. So that kind of already objects to kind of Levi's idea that um, mimicking or faking something could be sufficient because um, deception can in itself be devastating for somebody. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, I mean, as far as I know, um, you get, it's, it, I'm embarrassed to say I spent some time in life uh, researching pornography, and you get to the place where I really don't want to do this anymore. Um, and the same is true of trying to look at sex dolls and so forth. You, you, read, you read your sort of 10th or 12th article about this device and that device, and it's, I'm going to go have a beer, thank you. Um, as far as I know, uh, the state of the art right now is extremely primitive. Um, we have the, the real doll or the love dolls are uh, kind of amazing aesthetically. Uh, they have, you know, uh, real skeletons. Uh, they, they can be warmed up to a temperature of 98 degrees. Um, I won't go into other details because you can find it out, and you, at least after a point, I respond with a kind of ew uh, response. But um, Roxy is supposed to have an AI uh, within a year or two, uh, and the uh, real doll is supposed to have an AI in a year or two, but it, it's very primitive. Uh, there is one researcher at Stanford who advertised to find a man who would be willing to have sex with a robot so that the researcher could figure out if the robot was working properly. Oh, chatbots. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about that research at all. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to talk. 
Sorry. I would like to add to that because there are services uh, like the Invisible Boyfriend that you might know, and for $19.95 per month, you get uh, messages from personnel, no robots, but actual people that uh, seem that, that that mimic, that simulate a relationship to somebody else. For instance, people use it so that they are have so that they are left in, left in peace yeah. about uh, don't you have a relationship yet? Uh, say, for instance, homosexual people would fake heterosexual relationships uh, not to be bothered about that by their parents, for instance, or uh, other people uh, use it to, to get a divorce, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole endeavor uh, only works if somebody is believing in it. And it seems to be inevitable that from time to time or after some time, even the customer believes in it, mm -hmm. bringing about uh, emotional turbulences like uh, mm -hmm. being lovesick and yeah. stuff like that. The, the film Her mm -hmm. uh, uh, had it as a topic. Yeah. When, they, when the hero uh, noticed that, that the, the, the operating system uh, is in love with several million people at the <laughs> same time. Yeah. Uh, so so this, this brings about the question of genuineness yes. and the Turing test once again. Yeah. So you can't help but knowing that even in uh, romantic love relationships, there is always that fakeness. Uh, and the extreme is that you order it and in the end believe in it. Hmm. And what, what, what is left in the end is some sort of Turing test. Uh, uh, that 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 takes into account that there is no anything like uh, genuine and real. Hmm. What do you think about this? Um, I've been impressed by a comment recently from in in, in Kathleen Richardson's uh, most recent paper, uh, where she points out the Turing test. As far as I know, she's right. Uh, the Turing test is not about demonstrating the presence of consciousness. The Turing test is about fooling people, um, and so it's sort of been there from the very beginning. Um, again, I, I have a certain kind of ambivalence because I can see many circumstances within which being faked with knowledge and consent up to a point is not a problem. Uh, it's fine. Uh, it's also interesting, there's another group of people uh, I found out in one version of, of this. Uh, they have no erotic desire whatsoever. Uh, they can form deep friendships. They enjoy time with particular persons and so forth, but there's simply no sex. Uh, they're sometimes called the non-amorous or something like that. So this kind of account is not very helpful. I don't want to suggest this account is complete. Uh, it, it, it's limited. But um, I, in the end, I come back to Turkle that, that uh, if we, and, and Solon's, that, yeah, it's okay if I consent to be fooled. Or if I understand I'm being fooled for a good reason. Uh, but when I'm fooled and I have no control over it, uh, then I think it's morally problematic. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.